My name is John Handler. I'm a solutions architect with AWS, uh, and I'm joined by Josh Pavel. Hello, I'm DevSecOps engineer at Pearson. And we'll be talking to you this morning about Ingest and Amazon Elasticsearch service. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Over to you. Sure. So with modern applications, and especially uh, as we go and have more cloud adoption and more and more services that we're using, uh, we're generating tons and tons of log data. Now, your log data is really important. Your log data has the errors that are happening in your front ends. It has the performance of what's going on with your application. It has the key performance indicators, things like how people are using your application, what are they buying, et cetera, et cetera. Logs are great. Logs have fantastic information in them that you need. The problem is that's a log, right? It, this is an Apache web log. It is a wall of text. And if I have thousands of servers, the problem is multiplied by thousands. Something goes wrong, I have to go log into my servers, I have to go grab my logs, right? So that's not the sort of easiest way to, to use this data or to work with this data. Instead, you know, it would be really handy if we had a single pane of glass that could give us not only visualizations, but the ability to search in logs and bring out uh, errors and other things that are happening in, in the infrastructure. Uh, so enter uh, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a search engine. It's been around for about 10 years. You flow all your log data into Elasticsearch. You can search that log data as if it were a free text search or like some e-commerce application. And we have a technology called Kibana, which is a thin web client that allows you to visualize the data in your logs. Uh, this is performance information. So things like CPUs and different tasks that I'm running, this is an Elasticsearch cluster. So Kibana, thin web client, gives you visualization, gives you a nice front end for searching and getting information out of your logs. Elasticsearch, you can think of it like a database. So with Elasticsearch, you send log lines to Elasticsearch as JSON. Elasticsearch is going to index the fields and the values that are in that JSON for search. And then you use the front end to send queries, uh, or use the Elasticsearch REST APIs to send queries to Elasticsearch, uh, either to find particular log lines, or in the case of Kibana, to build uh, analytical kind of information uh, to present graphically. Today, and in this talk, we're focusing on this portion. So this is the ingest piece, and we're focusing on log analytics. In this case, I have servers, applications, AWS services, networking, uh, CPU, all of the kind of basic infrastructure information that I want to gather and send into Elasticsearch. And I'm going to touch on three topics uh, before Josh comes up and talks about uh, the experience that Pearson had with this. So the first thing is, we're going to talk at a, a sort of higher level about what the job of the ingest pipeline is and how to set that up with various services. Then we're going to talk about how to scale your Elasticsearch cluster for the particular ingest task that you want to send, it, send to it. And then we're going to talk about index lifecycle and data management within Elasticsearch and how you uh, roll data in and out of that hot store. So overall, when you are doing ingest, you have a number of different tasks. You have some data producers, like your servers, that are generating log files. So those have to be transferred from the source systems. We want to collect those and buffer them because we don't want to overwhelm Elasticsearch with connections. So we have to funnel down into a single pathway. We need to transform those log lines because originally they're strings. Elasticsearch works with JSON, so we have to transform. And ultimately, we have to deliver that data to Elasticsearch. We have a second pathway here, uh, which is cold storage. Uh, this is a, a kind of adjunct that we use. So when we have this ingest pathway, we have our hot real-time uh, path. And then we use S3, uh, and now that we've announced UltraWarm will be an interesting addition and change to this slide. Uh, but we use S3 to store the original data, either in Parquet or in the original uh, log format. And then we can use tools like Athena, Redshift Spectrum, uh, sometimes bring it back to Elasticsearch, EMR, the, for longer term, more forensic kind of analysis. 
There's a couple of different ways, and these are straw men, but a couple of different patterns that we see that are very common. So the first of those is I'm sending my logs directly to S3. When the object is created in S3, it's gonna kick off a creation event. I'm gonna pick that up with Lambda, and I'm either gonna pop it into an SQS queue in this case, that's the collect, right? In the SQS queue, Lambda is going to then transform and deliver the records to Elasticsearch. So this is one common pattern. Another common pattern is to use Amazon Kinesis uh, data streams or Firehose. Uh, with data streams, I'm going to take, say, Fluentd, Logstash, maybe even another stream. That's gonna write into a Kinesis data stream. Again, Lambda is gonna pick that up, transform, and send to Elasticsearch. Just there's a plethora of options in terms of that set of steps. So I wanted to put up a few, uh, just kind of point at them and say, we have uh, on the collector side, we have the CloudWatch agent and the Kinesis data, uh, Kinesis, sorry, uh, data streams agent uh, that can pick up the logs directly off of your servers. Those we also have in the open source world. Uh, we have FluentBit, FluentD, uh, Elastics Beats, and then at JVM, we also have Logstash directly on the instance, picking up those log files, forwarding downstream, and Flume as well. Uh, for buffering, we see a lot of different solutions here. Uh, CloudWatch, SQS, Kinesis Data Streams, S3 itself, Kinesis Data Firehose, IoT. Those would be the AWS kind of options. In the open source world, we see lots of folks using either Kafka, Redis, RabbitMQ, Managed Streaming for Kafka, Elasticache for Redis, these are all um, buffering options. Aggregators, you can use AWS Lambda. Again, this is pulling from one of those collector uh, systems. You can use Fluentd, Logstash on the open source side to pull that data out of the buffered, buffering option, push it to Elasticsearch. Okay. So we're gonna to jump topics, and we're gonna talk about how to scale your Elasticsearch service domain for your particular ingest workload. So when we think about scaling, and when we're trying to do sizing and capacity planning, you wanna think about storage and compute. For storage, it's fairly straightforward. You can look at how much log data you're flowing in, and you can calculate from that how much storage you're gonna need. That provides you a baseline, a minimum set of instances that you'd need to deploy to support that amount of storage. Then it gets a little bit trickier. Uh, Elasticsearch, the resource usage is highly dependent on the data itself, on the, the schema that you're putting in place, on the actual work you're doing when you're ingesting. Um, so once you have that baseline in terms of storage, you can look at the compute and do you have enough to support it. So we're gonna, we're gonna walk through sort of how you think about that. When you use Amazon Elasticsearch Service, you deploy what we call a, a domain. Domain is hardware and software that provides Elasticsearch for you with, at a REST endpoint. You use normal Elasticsearch APIs to talk to Elasticsearch to send your data and to run queries. Under the covers, Elasticsearch is a distributed database system so we have a set of instances in EC2. These are service managed, so you don't manage all of this, you just tell us which instances you want. We have data nodes. When you flow data in and it gets indexed, it gets indexed on the data nodes. Data nodes are your primary resource in your Elasticsearch cluster. In addition to data nodes, you have master nodes. Um, you can deploy dedicated nodes just to be cluster masters in Amazon Elasticsearch Service. Those master nodes don't do any processing of data itself. They're coordinator nodes, they, they maintain the state of the cluster and they keep the cluster as a cluster. So they add additional stability to your Elasticsearch Service domain, but they don't add processing power. We do recommend that you use master nodes for all production workloads. Uh, if you have dev and test workloads, uh, not as necessary because if the cluster should fall over, it's not as, uh, as big a problem in a dev environment. So your data nodes are really gonna be where all your processing and storage happen. 
the instance type and the instance count are your primary levers in terms of scaling to handle your right workload. So we're gonna talk about how do you think about the components of that and pick a set of instances that's gonna successfully index your right workload and provide you the query capacity. As I said, we like to start with storage. Uh, if we look at storage, uh, this, is a, this is a formula. This formula is wrong, um, but it is directionally correct. It provides you with some of the thinking behind uh, how you should figure out your storage need. So we first start with our source data. Uh, you know if you're flowing, say, 300 gigabytes of logs a day, that's your source data, right? Then on disk, when Elasticsearch creates an index, that index is gonna be a different size than your source data. We've seen it range anywhere from one-tenth the size of the source data to 10 times the source data. Here's where I said this is very workload dependent. 10% uh, larger is a, an empirically more or less accurate guess at the inflation size. Of course, if you're doing ingest, you can index a bunch of stuff according to your uh, schema, your own logs, and you'll get the actual ratio. If you do that, then you can put that in this formula directly, right? But we assume a 10% inflation, so we multiply by 1.1. Then Elasticsearch allows you to deploy replicas of your data. The first replica that you deploy is a second copy of your primary data, and it provides you redundancy because Elasticsearch will split the primary copy and the replica onto different instances. If you lose an instance, you retain the data in the other instance, and Elasticsearch recovers it from there. So it's very important to use at least one replica. Our best practice in production is to use two replicas and three zone uh, deployment. And that's a checkbox in Elasticsearch service. Uh, in this case, we take the medium approach of, two, of one replica, which means we multiply the storage need by two, because that replica is a copy, right? We need to copy that somewhere. When you do log analytics, you're usually gonna retain the data in Elasticsearch service for some time period. One week is a very common choice for retention period. Um, we're gonna talk about, again, lifecycle management, rolling that data in and out of the cluster, but assuming it's a, a one week retention, then we need to multiply by seven, because we're doing this every day and we're storing it seven days. Finally, we need to add overhead because Elasticsearch needs to have free storage space or it stops uh, putting more information onto instances. So we add a 15% overhead to account for that uh, additional storage need. And what we're gonna do is do that calculation, deploy some instances based on the storage required, or pick some instances. Now when you're sending data to Elasticsearch, that data goes into an index. Index, you can think of like a database table. Uh, it doesn't work exactly like a database table, but you can think of it that way. And within that index, you have a partitioning strategy that you set by setting a shard count. Okay, so I say I want five shards. That means my data is evenly distributed across five partitions of, of well, five shards. You can have, as I said, primaries and replicas. Your primary shard count defines the partitioning of your data. Your replica shard count is a dynamic setting of how many copies of that data you want. I mentioned the single uh, replica that you use for redundancy. If you need to scale for capacity, then you add more replicas and more instances for those replicas, and that increases your uh, either search or indexing capacity. Now shards are the workers in Elasticsearch. So shards are really the fundamental unit of scale. They store data, and they process index, indexing requests, and they process queries. So when we think about capacity planning, the shard is our central focus. We have to, to define the shard count for our indexes so that they successfully distribute wide enough to parallelize, and we have to make sure that we have enough CPUs to service the shards that are processing requests. So as we think about it, we have a storage baseline, but now we're gonna look at how do we put compute against that data set. The first thing is you wanna, again, set the shard count correctly 
so that you distribute the processing wide enough. The best practice, and for log analytics, uh, is to use 50 gigabytes as a maximum shard size. And you can get pretty close to that. Uh, we say 40 gigabytes here. It's nice to have a little bit of headroom so that as your workload grows, you're able to respond and make changes. Uh, but you're fine up to 50 gigabytes. That is, um, again, best practice. Now, how do you get that set up, right? So you're creating an index every day. Now, that could be a manual process, but we don't really want to go every day and manually create an index. So Elasticsearch has an API called the Template API that lets you go and define a template that says, for each index that's created that matches this template, I want to set this shard count and this replica count. That way, whenever your tools or your ingest tools are creating an index, it will get this setting. So when I say set the shard count so that you have 50 gigabytes of shard, what you want to do is set a template with a number of primary shards that divides your storage size into 50 gigabyte chunks. If I'm storing a terabyte of data and it, I'm storing a terabyte of index, I need 25 shards to come out at 40 gigabytes. But storage is really not the whole story. Storage, again, is the, the baseline. So when we think about the processing that happens in Elasticsearch when you send up updates to it, when you're ingesting data, your update request is going to go and land on some node. That node is going to serve as a coordinator. It's going to figure out from your bulk operation which are the shards that this, this applies to, which shards need to process this. It will then forward that request to all of the primaries for that index. The primaries will forward to the replicas, and then primaries write first, replicas write, respond out through the coordinator. So if I have one stream of data coming in, let's say this is Apache web logs, I need to have one each of the primaries and one each of the replicas that are going to respond to that event. If I have another stream of data, let's say this is syslogs, I have, again, the primaries and the replicas. If I have a third stream of data, application logs. If I have a fourth stream of data, VPC flow logs. All of my ingest, as it goes into the indexes, those indexes are, the shards of those indexes are grabbing CPU to do all of this. So as a very high level approximation, we say that your CPU count needs to be more than your primary shard count for the indexes you're actively using. In this case, well, I just assume that each of these uh, indexes has five primary shards. So for stream one, I'm using 10 CPUs. For stream two, I'm using 10 CPUs, et cetera. I'm using 40 concurrent CPUs. So if I look at my instance types, I have to make sure I have at least 40 CPUs uh, to handle this workload. And I would go and I'd say, okay, let's say this is on i3 two X larges that have eight CPUs, I need to have at least five, but probably more like seven or eight uh, to handle this particular workload. If we kind of game all that out, we have some t-shirt sizing. Uh, again, what we're doing here, we have the uh, t-shirt size is just a cut at it. The amount of data that I'm flowing in per day, this is my source. Then I have the storage I need that comes directly from that formula I gave you. So again, this table is wrong, uh, but it is directionally correct, right? So uh, in this case, storage needed based on seven days. Uh, if you're retaining for 30 days, obviously that all changes, right? That's a storage needed. Uh, I look at the active shards maximum. This is based on the number of CPUs based on the recommendation for instances, right? So for the extra smalls, I'm saying two M5 R5. Uh, those each have two vCPUs, that gives me four total vCPUs. That means I could expect to concurrently process four uh, shards, right? And then I have a total shards column. We do see uh, commonly, well, not so commonly, but customers do push out beyond that 30,000 shard number. Um, it's, it's a magic number also, but uh, we do see as the number of shards in the cluster grows, uh, total shards, this is not just today's shards, this is also the older data. As that grows, uh, 
that takes up heap space, it takes up cluster resources. 30,000 is about an expectation, 25,000 on the, on the slide, of where you can push Elasticsearch. Beyond that, stuff starts to go south. Um, so we just very straightforwardly said, okay, let's say I have this extra large workload, 10, ter uh, 10 terabytes a day, 177 terabytes total. Uh, that means I'm gonna have uh, these R5 8x larges, and I'm gonna run up to 600 uh, concurrent shards. Just a quick comment, we have R5 and I3 as high performing instances and good instances for the service. In this chart, I picked R5. Uh, R5s are a newer generation processor. They are EBS backed, so you take a little bit of hit for EBS communication, but it's not that bad. It's in the 10% to 15% range. And you gain, you gain that, that newer processor uh, series. And for log analytics, that 10 to 15% Usually not fatal, usually you're fine. Uh, on the lower end, we have the M5s and, um, or the R5s. The M5s are our general purpose machines. Uh, for smaller workloads, they're completely fine. They're at a lower cost point, uh, so that's, that can be useful there. So just a couple of things to say about lifecycle management. When you send your log lines into Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch, you're gonna create a document. Document is the core entity that you send in. It's the entity that comes back from a search engine. Your document is composed of a set of fields. It's JSON, composed of a set of fields. And you, the key insight is that each log line essentially has some structure to it, which is not like a JSON structure, but we have a set of fields in here. We have a host name, we have a timestamp, we have an HTTP verb, we have a request URL, size, status, all of those things are gonna go into a document that's gonna be the basis of what Elasticsearch is working with. Uh, and so this is a, just a direct flat transformation of the string log line into JSON. You're going to create that somewhere in that transform step of the ingest pipe, and you're gonna send that to an index. For data lifecycle management and for how you manage this data in Elasticsearch, you're gonna create indexes that are based on a root string, in this case, logs, and have a date stamp. So every day, you're gonna start creating a new index. Actually, your tool is probably gonna do this for you. You're gonna create a new index with the timestamp day for that index. At the end of the day, you're gonna then delete off that last index as you roll over into your new index. Sometimes you're gonna snapshot that index. Uh, you're gonna take a backup of it before you delete it off the cluster, store that in S3. Later date, you may wanna bring that back in uh, to be able to work with the data again. The reason to do this is, again, simplify the index management. So we're just gonna keep this rolling set of indexes in the hot store, which is Elasticsearch, uh, and then manage it that way. I mentioned templates a while back. Um, the template API, again, allows you to set a particular set of settings for any index created that matches a particular pattern. In this case, I've set a template that says the pattern is logs dash star. So all of these settings and mappings, which is schema, gets applied to any index that gets created that matches logs dash star. That way, when my index rolls over, I don't have to manually go and create that index with those settings. That's an automatic, it just comes in. And again, index lifecycle, at the end of the day, you take a snapshot of the existing oldest index. Um, perhaps you don't, perhaps you don't need that, you have it in S3 already or whatever. And then you delete uh, the oldest index from the cluster. Delete, HTTP delete, is a much more performant way to roll data out of your cluster than to try to do deletes for individual documents. So you always wanna manage it. In a sense, this is again, at the table level, you're dropping a table. That's much more performant than deleting individual rows. So that's a, a sort of broad introduction to some of the concerns around ingest. Uh, I'm gonna bring up Josh Bobble now, and he's gonna talk about Pearson. Thank you so much. So everything John told you is true. We didn't start out there. 
<laughs> so I learned a lot of those lessons that he just told you the hard way. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got there. So I'm going to tell you about the problem that we had, the design, the process, the results that we're seeing now, and where we're going at Pearson. Uh, if you don't know who Pearson is, it's the learning company. You might have heard about us, our, our motto there, always learning. Nice little logo there in the corner. Uh, it's an education company. Used to make textbooks. Everything's being remade to a digital front now. So my job there is security. And my first task was to make sure that we are centralizing all of our logs. The problem that I was given was all of these logs we have, they're, they're over here, they're over there. We need to make sure we have them centrally managed. We need to run analytics on them, know what's happening. It's not just an excuse to show a photo of myself, but this is myself at the age of 13 with my first car, 1971 Volkswagen Carmen Ghia convertible. Any fans? No fans. Okay, so <laughs> it looks like a Porsche and it runs like a Volkswagen. Uh, what an interesting con uh, convention. But this is my first car. The guy who had it before me did something very unfortunate. All the wires in the back of the car, he covered it in spray insulation. You know what I'm talking about? So you have electricity going through wires. You can guess what's going to happen, right? All the wires melted down into one place. So you would pump the brakes and the windshield wipers would go. <laughs> you turn on the radio, and you know who knows what electrical system is going to malfunction. It was a disaster. Uh, we had all this information coming to the computers, or not computers in a 71 Volkswagen, uh, but going to the different components, but they were all getting crossed. We didn't know what was where, and it actually led to the death of that car. So there's two very important sensors, oil, generator. My oil light all of a sudden was flipped to the generator light. So one day I'm driving and my generator says, you know, you gotta check the generator. So to work on a generator, what do you do? You have to run the engine. You run it hot. Well, if you run an engine hot without oil, which was really the problem, the engine seizes up. It's a big problem. So this is kind of like the, what the world was like at Pearson. We had all this information, but we didn't know where it was coming from. We didn't know what to do with it. We didn't have it centralized. We didn't have it managed. We didn't have the analytics to look into it. As a security guy, you want to make sure that you know what's happening. One of the worst feelings is saying, oh, I know exactly where I can find that problem in the logs now that I know where to look for it. It's finding the th these things after the fact. So what we needed to do was to go from this idea of chaos ah, to this. If you worked in a server farm, you know what I'm talking about. Your first build always looks like the first one, like this. And then you're like, no, 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 I can't do that. I, I unplug one networking cable, everything gets crossed. We all want to live in this world. So the idea of this is not just how to do this thing, but why. Why do we need to manage this thing at scale? Why do we need to do this well? Why does this matter? Uh, my job is not to run Elasticsearch. I don't know if anybody here, are you running Elasticsearch now? Have you run your own Elasticsearch on your own servers and you've installed the software? But you've got to manage who's got a managed instance. OK, this is good. So yes, the idea is not just that we move these logs to one central place, but we need to do something with them. And so to get from one state where we were to the new state, I just follow the, the traditional DevOps me method, right? You want to do it first. You, you might do it bad, but you just get it done. So my very first implementation of Elasticsearch and Jest, I had every single log line that I read, and I put it into another Lambda, which I read it, and then I put that single log line into Elasticsearch. And it worked. It was great. And my manager said, well done. You know, let's, let's, let's get more people on here. Let's do it. And for security purposes, that was almost OK for us. But then we started adding customers. More and more accounts wanted to come on here. And as we got that scale, we realized this isn't going to keep up. And it, the problem wasn't Elasticsearch. The problem was how we were using it. So I like this quote. Think of a bicycle wheel. It goes round and round, but it's moving forwards, not standing still. The same circuit around the hub of the wheel becomes part of the forward movement of the bicycle as a whole. We could spend our days worrying about ingest, and we never move forward. We could spend these days trying to just get this thing to scale out, and we're just solving these same problems again and again. We're not actually moving forward. The point of centralizing our logging, the point of doing this thing at scale, is that we can move on to the more interesting problems. I needed to do something with my logs. The point of Elasticsearch, the point of this ingest, the point of our product, was that there's some information in there that we need to get to. It's not an academic problem. There are academic problems in there. But it's a functional problem. We need to move somewhere. And so I put this up here, too. If I've seen further, 
It's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Not just to nod at AWS, but just an acknowledgement that they've solved some of these problems so we don't have to. We can stand on those shoulders and actually move on to what makes our business work better. I'm able to take their, their ingest, I'm able to take their, their platform and do something with it. So we had some design goals that kind of helped us see how we're gonna be solving this thing for our own things. This started off, as much as we can, keep it simple. We're in the cloud for a reason, let's be in the cloud. You know, could we spin up our own Elasticsearch on EC2? Yeah, we could, but I don't wanna do that. Could we use those other AMIs? Sure we could, but I don't wanna do that. And why is that? Well, because all of these AWS components work together. You know, they speak the same language. Uh, there, there, there's benefits that you buy into this ecosystem and things start paying off. And so we wanted to try to keep it simple. Plus, as a security guy, simplicity is a security principle. OWASP, any OWASP fans? I might be the only one, there we go. Uh, simplicity is a security principle. So knowing that we needed to design a secure system, if we make this overly complex, if we make this something that I understand but nobody else in the room does, trying to hand this off to the operations team, trying to hand this off to, to my coworkers, it's gonna require way more work than I wanna do. And like I said, I wanna move on to more interesting problems. I wanna do this thing at scale so we can do something with these logs. So, it was all a security design because we know that logs are sensitive data, right? They might not mean to be insecure, but all of a sudden you see something in a log and you're like, oh, why did that developer log that? Why is there a password in plain text? Why, why do we have this information being shared? And once it's in there, if you're looking at this at scale where you have billions or trillions of log lines, there's no human eye that's gonna be scanning all those things. So out of the gate, we knew we had to keep this off the internet. We knew we had to keep it simple. We had to follow least principle access. We needed to make everything private and encrypted and insured. And the AWS Elasticsearch allows us to do that. So what is our design? That was the overview stuff. Now I'm gonna get a bit more technical for you. Our design on the client account is this. We transform early. John has something very similar to this. You can see our producers there on your left, the logs. They'll go into either Amazon S3 or Amazon CloudWatch. Then those are read by a Lambda. That Lambda does an assume role and it does a push to a Kinesis stream for us. One of the first questions people get when they understand these components is why are you doing a transform so early? You could do a transform in a whole lot of steps in this. Kinesis has built-in transform. Elasticsearch has some transform. But we found that whenever we're actually doing the analysis here, everything after gets the benefit of the transform. So if we, if we have a unified format, we're actually able to attach the metadata to these logs. That metadata allows us to say, hey, I know that this log you know, looks like this type, but I want you to use this schema when we ingest it. Or I want you to play with the retention policy for this log, put it into this index, change the shard count for this one. We could attach this metadata, and it allows us to do more things with it. Part of that is also our integration with Splunk. We still have Splunk as a part of our ecosystem. Uh, it does some things slightly different than what Elasticsearch does, and we still have some use cases for that. We don't want to send everything to Splunk. That's a costly thing. It can't handle the same load in the same way that we have with Elasticsearch. So we only want to send a small portion of our logs to Splunk. We're able to tag some data and say, this log, send this one to Splunk. The rest of this, send it right through. All right, so those Kinesis streams connect to one centralized logging account for us. And here is our ingest here. Those same streams you just saw come in here, they go into Kinesis data streams, multiple streams for multiple purposes. We've got CloudTrail, we have VPC flow logs, we have some client application logs. Our Kinesis streams are something that we use to scale this thing. Some of these logs are very, very chatty. Some of them barely get used. Guard duty, we want to never get used. But we still have a unique stream because when we pull off of Kinesis, we're able to direct that flow to another source. So guard duty, we're able to put into a, dis a different uh, Kinesis Firehose stream, which can send it to our SOC, and they can do their own analysis and process it there. So Kinesis data streams, it's pulled off from that directly into Lambda, and the Lambda pushes it into Elasticsearch for us. That same Kinesis data stream that has that Lambda, it is also read by Firehose, and Firehose, like I was saying, talks to Splunk, and it always puts into S3, and that goes into Glacier for us as well. That is all VPC restricted. We use VPC endpoints. Everything's private, everything's tucked away, everything's secure. Uh, you can't get at these systems. None of our loggings, none of our producers 
can talk directly to our Elasticsearch. Um, but they can all ingest through the pipelines, through these methods that we control. All right, so the results. Let's get into some of the numbers. What do we actually see with our system here? So when this started off, and before I, I, I actually came here, we had 14 accounts on there, which is a terrible representation of this, um, because that's not true anymore, but also because what does an account mean? An account could mean you know, a thousand lines, or it could mean trillions of lines. It's, it's the number of things in there. But we had 14 accounts, then it was 20 accounts, and I think now we're actually at almost about 30. And we're adding more all the time. Our end state's gonna be probably several hundred, if not thousands of, of Amazon accounts in this. The data size we're looking at was four terabytes uh, over 30 days. We're scaling and testing this thing to be about 500 terabytes over 30 days. Uh, the number of log lines that, that we're seeing about 17,000 per second, that's actually still old. We're currently seeing, I think, 26,000 lines per second, um, which is gonna be a whole lot more log lines for that. And we tested this thing up to 100,000 uh, lines per second. So that's pretty good ingest, but how do we do this? These are our processing times as it comes through that whole system. So from that client account producer until it's realized in S3, until it's realized in Elasticsearch, or until it's in Splunk. So you can see right here, I, I gave you my, my good max, my minimum, and my average. All right, the maximum, don't let that concern you, but if you notice, our max for the worst case here is our delivery to Elasticsearch max is 18,000 milliseconds. That's not so bad. Uh, in fact, when we designed this thing, we weren't wanting to be necessarily real time. I don't know how you define real time, but you know, you wanna have a small window between it's, when it's produced and whenever it's visible. So 18,000 milliseconds isn't so bad, but if you look at our average for our delivered elastic search, our average is just over 2,000 milliseconds, and our minimum is barely even 100 milliseconds. And we do all this through bulking, uh, bulk and batch, <coughs> pardon me, and the, the biggest hit there, when you look at our maximum scores, it's whenever Lambda spin up a new container, right? A little bit of a cold storage hit whenever you do that, but there's very few that are gonna be hitting our, our max limit here. All right, so one of the things people ask is, what are we paying for, what's the cost? And let me just say, I have this as a pie chart because uh, one of the concerns people ask is, you know, we've got this client infrastructure. If you've got this installed into every region, if you've got people that need to install lambdas in every region that have to talk to this centralized Kinesis, if I have all these shards of, of Kinesis, I've got shards of Elastic, what am I actually paying for? So whenever we talk to customers that are gonna be onboarding to our account, we make sure that they understand so little of this is on that customer side. That ingest pipeline itself is a small percentage of this. So only 6% of this is what I would consider the pipeline that's coming into us. Uh, the rest that we're paying for is the storage. And the great thing about that, that storage, those data nodes, those master nodes, you can scale that up and down as it re results for your need. So you don't have to worry about that as much. For our 6%, for those client accounts, again, what we're seeing here is Kinesis is a big part of it. The Lambda, those portions of it are very, very small. The master nodes made into the 6% as well, but it's not a concern. Comparing this, for instance, to our Splunk installation, which is not to speak ill of Splunk, they do different things, it's a fraction of the cost. We're able to deploy this and our customers are able to get a benefit of a centralized logging solution without having to buy into this whole big ecosystem. Uh, what they're paying for, what they see, is just a small part of this. So, if you've done this, I wanna walk you through some of our specific lessons learned. This is, uh, I mean, we bumped our knees on and our shins on every dining room table in the place, all right? I, I, I refuse to listen to John's wise, sage advice, and, I, and I, I thought we could do this our own ways. I didn't want to do daily indices. I thought, oh, I can do this with just one index, and I can just keep writing to that thing. It'll scale better, it'll, it'll work fine. But quickly, 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 we learned right off the bat, bulk and batch, every chance you get. Bulk and batch. At scale, there's no way around this. Bulk add to Kinesis. Bulk add to Elasticsearch. There's the Python library, you can just ingest it right away. Batch process your events in lambdas. Batch size reading from Kinesis. Uh, this stuff made a huge performance difference for us. And this is all it took. On the client lambda, put record became put records. It's really that simple. I really wish somebody had said RTFM, Josh. It's, it's, it's right there. there, there's a call for it. You know, put records. Now I had to do some data manipulation. We need to make sure that we, we created an array instead of a single instance, but again, if you guys have done this, that's not so bad. When we're ingesting it into Elasticsearch, helpers.bulk. 
Again, same data structure, you just have all these files together, you, all, you put them together, you can just do this push. And all of a sudden, what was a single line and what was taking that, that processing time away from everything else, we're able to bulk together. We're doing 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 bulk pushes at the same time, and it is exponentially improved on our CPUs. Credential duration matters. If you guys remember from our diagram here, we have a client that authorizes, does an assume role to put into our Kinesis stream. Now, whenever I first did this, you know, I'm a security guy, I wanna make sure that I have short-lived tokens and, and these credentials are there, so I'm gonna authorize every single time that I'm gonna to write to Kinesis. Now, conceptually, I get that, but what we noticed quickly was 50% of our logs were assume roles for our client logging because every single time we push into the system, we have to do an assume role. So it was creating exponentially more logs as there's like three or four log entries for every assume role that I'm doing to put it into the system. So it just was this non-stop slaughter of authorization requests. So realize that that's really not gonna help our problem at all. I don't wanna not log authorization requests, so how, what do I do? And so credential, credential duration matters. I authorize the container that runs the Lambda one time as it spins up. I run the credential there, I check to make sure it's valid, and then I do my push to Kinesis. It's a constant system. I don't know about you guys, but we never have a second where we don't have logs going, right? Something's chatting, something's doing something, VPC flow logs are coming from something, CloudTrail's doing something. Uh, you know, there's people around the world using our systems, it's always up. So credential duration matters a whole lot. All right, another RTFM moment for me. Kinesis start point matters. I was not an expert on Kinesis. Somebody said, you should check out Kinesis. I checked out Kinesis, I used it, it worked. I thought, great, it's simple. That, that's all I needed to worry about. And then all of a sudden there's some weird behavior going on and I had to do some troubleshooting and digging and this is what I wish somebody had said to me. I use latest. Latest sounds good. You know, if I want to start reading off of a Kinesis stream and push it into Elasticsearch, I'm going to use latest. And so I started using latest, and, and what I noticed was there's every now and then there's a problem where my logs would get reprocessed. I would hit a stumbling block, and then it would just churn the same logs again. And hit that same stumbling block, and then it would churn the same logs again, always from that latest point. Because I was bulk these requests, I bulked these out, and the retry was here, so it would come back, and it would try again from that latest point until that's part. What we wanted to use was Trim Horizon, and it's right there in the manual. <laughs> trim Horizon, start streaming at the last untrimmed record in the shard, which is the oldest data record in the shard. Um, that was what I wanted to do. If it hasn't been trimmed off, start from that point. Uh, that allowed my dead letter queue, that allowed my retry to function as we had them designed. So again, guys, this, the documentation's there. You think you know these things, learn the best practices. You can find something that's gonna help you out a whole lot. But what this allowed us to see was that reprocessing was a great stress test for us. We reprocessed millions of logs in a few seconds, and the impressive thing was our Elasticsearch never fell over. Our, our buffering system that we have in Kinesis never fell over. Uh, we noticed it in the logs, we had to look and see, and this is what I want to tell you, where do you see these problems? Iterator age. <coughs> Our iterator age tells you how long something is sitting in these queues. Uh, how long is it taking these, these lambdas to pick things off the queue? How long is it taking Kinesis to get stuff off of Kinesis and into the next stage of, of your design? So watching our iterator age allows us to see whenever there's a problem slowing things down. The other thing was whenever we we're exceeding our read throughput or our write throughput. We hit this one a number of times. We saw this problem, and it was an API call limit. And I was a little frustrated at this one. I was like, well, how are we running out of APIs? We're, we have Firehose, we have Lambda making uh, API calls against Kinesis. How are we running out of these things? And so we started playing with multiple streams, and that, that helped it a little bit. But it was the shard count inside Kinesis. Increasing the number of shards that we had in Kinesis allowed us to increase the number of APIs that we can make against those things. But we would see the problem. You'd see little blips here. We haven't had one in a while, which is why I couldn't get a good graph of it for this slide. But we'd see these little blips where we'd have this, this error, and that would tell us, oh, we, we ran out of APIs again. We, we need to scale out our Kinesis. Again, though, with the dead letter queue and retry, those blips were non-fatal. We didn't lose a log through this whole thing. So what are we doing with this data? And this is actually in this portion because part of what we're doing is we're alerting on our system itself. If ingest falls to zero, 
If there's a problem somewhere in this pipeline, I need to know about it. If I'm missing some logs, I need to know about it. So ingestion fails is one of the things that we're, we're looking for. Authentication failures, console sign-in failures, all these things for us are webhooks to Slack. So this is real-time analytics, what's going on in our systems right now, posted in Slack so somebody knows and somebody knows what to do about it. Uh, we needed to keep these things simple. This is just a, a, a simple list of those things that we're seeing. A lot of these are trends that we need to track over time, but some of this stuff we need to know right away. And this is an example of what we see in Slack. So it would pop up. This is using the Kibana alerting mechanism. And it will say, you know, here's the index, this is the region, this is the source, and we have this API call being denied. Now, why, was, why is that the case? Well, it could be API threshold limits, it could be somebody's trying to do something that they don't have IAM access controls to, um, but this is what we began seeing as soon as we turned this on. These were happening all the time, by the way, and we just had no idea. It's again like my Carmen Ghia with the, those blue wires that are, are crossed and you're getting these messages but you don't know what's going on. It, it's a, a tree falling in the forest, is it making any sound, right? So we needed to know what was happening, we need to make sure that we could pull those things out so we could process them. This is just an example of one of the visualizations we have on it. Uh, these are security runs we have by account and you can see the findings. I have pertinent information blacked out because I don't want you guys to know about it. <laughs> All right, another lesson learned. Watch your field growth. Watch your field growth. Um, this is something that, that as your JSON blobs get more and more complex, the, the potential fields that you're gonna get in these JSON blobs that, that are, are defining your records, it's gonna grow. And CloudTrail, oh, CloudTrail was the real, real instigator of this for us. So these fields would grow and all of a sudden I would see these errors pop up through our, our alerts that all of a sudden our ingestion is, is failing. You look through the logs and Elasticsearch is rejecting these things because it won't create any new fields. There's a field limit saying, I'm not gonna let this thing get out of control. You can't have a million different fields in one of these document types. We've gotta make sure we limit that. So index.mapping total field limit. This is the way that whenever you're creating an index that you're able to set something that defines some extent of how far, how deep CloudTrail can go. All right, when we're tuning this, we're uh, running this in a Lambda for us because again, we don't wanna be doing this by hand. I wanna solve more interesting problems. Uh, what we found, kinda like what John was saying, storage is cheap, but shards are not. We have to calculate for shards. Shards are what manage for us. If, if you've done your own Elasticsearch, and a lot of you had, you can actually get different sized nodes right in Elasticsearch cluster that you can pin different data types to. It's complex, it's very time consuming, but you can do it. I, I have a, a, a high throughput disk on, on this one. I wanna put you know, really rapid writing things to this. I have a lot of storage on this one, but I hardly ever access it. I'm gonna change you know, the type of logs that go there. But in Elasticsearch, you get the same type, which is great, but it means that you need to know what you're getting into. We found we're trying to keep our shards at about 20 gigs. Uh, we haven't really needed to, to go to the 40 gigs that, that John mentioned. Most of ours were well under that because of daily rotation keeping our, our, our shards per node less than 3,000, and then we found out that when we hit about 10,000 shards, we needed to reevaluate, figure out what's going on with this. Are, are we still seeing this thing working well? But again, your type of data will matter. What data are you putting in here? How often are you reading? What's hot? What's cold? What's being used all the time? Very simple little way to, to calculate how many data nodes you have. John's was better. You should use that one. Okay. <laughs> our tuning al algorithm. Persistent cluster max shards per node, you can set your own value with that, right? How many shards do I need per node? I can scale this up, I can scale this down, make sure that we're not overdoing our shard count. But on index creation, it matters as well. This is where we fix CloudTrail. Index mapping total fields limit, 5,000. We haven't gone over that yet with CloudTrail. I don't exactly know how many fields you know, CloudTrail's gonna need, but it's less than 5,000 with our use case. Uh, same thing John had there, number of shards and our number of replicas. I can't go below one replica. It might use a lot of shards, but even though this is only our, our, our real-time analytics, nothing, no data, if it fails to go into Elasticsearch, we don't lose the data. But even still, you know, I want the system to stay up. I wanna make sure that people can trust it and we know that we can rely on this. So I leave my replicas at one. All right, another lesson learned. Nested fields, if you are a developer, arrays are your friend, right? Just put it all in there, it can, it can scale. I have 10, 15, 20 items in this list, that's great. In Kibana, fields are so hard to parse. 
uh, to get a visualization, to try to make something happen. If you've got something in an array, it's not gonna work so well in Kibana. We had to really work with our developers on some custom logs to flatten this data. Part of the, the wonderful thing about our design is that we do that transform. We're able to say, like, if you've got this in an array format, we're gonna parse it out. We're gonna do something else with this data because we wanna be able to make sure that this data can be used. So, nested fields, or also making these flatter. Index rotation. I fought this one for a long time. John gave us exactly what we need to do, a daily rotation. We were doing deletes by query, and I was like, it's fine. You know, it, it, it works fine for our, our security logs and cloud trail and VPC flow logs. I, I can say anything older than 30 days, delete. And I started running that query on a daily basis, and it, it took five minutes. That's fine. Started taking 20 minutes, and then it took 30 minutes, then it took an hour, and then it took four hours, and then I was like, okay. Delete by query, I'm, I'm over you. I, I need to do this a better way. And I knew that John had told me, you've got to do this daily rotation thing. And we were handling our own, our own index creation. I was like, ah, okay, fine, I'll give it a shot. Our index deletion now is just seconds. Uh, we're able to rotate this data off, maintain our integrity, and there's no compute power being wasted for that. Because the problem is those delete by queries, when they're running, they're taking CPU away from other things as well. Uh, and there's always this ingest coming in. So if we're running those queries to delete, it's not gonna work out for us. It simplifies retention. Uh, it does complicate our access controls. We care a whole lot about who can see what data. Like I said, logs are secure. They're private data. So we need to make sure that whenever somebody's getting into these systems, they only have access to logs that they need to. That means we have more granular access controls for each of our indices. Each of our indices has gotta be something that only developer team A can see, but not developer team B. And that's why we have our data organization and segregation plan. We use account and our type and our unique. And we want to make sure that users who need to see a certain type of data, they can only see that data and not the other ones. So when our indices come in, we tag them with this information, we create an index for that. It all happens through our automated pip pipelines and everything goes into its correct place. At scale, we hit a big data problem. Uh, this didn't happen at first. Uh, this took maybe nine months for us to see this thing pop up. So we have all this data coming in. We have terabytes of data, and we're running our queries, we're running our alerts, we're running our visualizations, and all of a sudden, the visual, visualizations that I ran every single day started failing with this very cryptic message, payload content length greater than maximum allowed. And you Google that up and you figure out what's going on. It's a field that you can easily set in your Elasticsearch YAML con uh, config file. Now, we don't have rights to write that because this is on a managed service. So I was really stumped and I was really frustrated. I didn't know what to do. It's like, how are we gonna get away from this? Well, this was back before we were doing our daily indices. And what was happening was this was all a big browser request, sending all this data through to the browser. And as soon as we moved to a daily index, it got chunked up and it came through. A daily index actually solved this problem for us. All right, so this whole design for us, as compared to the alternates that we evaluated, it's the most flexible, it's the most scalable. We were able to do it in one of the most secure ways. It's effective just because it works and the cost is way, way, way less than all the other solutions that we looked at. And at the end of the day, you know, for my uses, it's, it's great. I care about security. I need to make sure that that works. Other people at our company, they care about the cost. They want to make sure that we're not spending money on things that we're not using. We need to make sure that it's actually accomplishing that point, that we're not just checking a box saying our logs are now centralized. Isn't that nice? No, we need to make sure that we're able to action them, analyze them, do things with them. So this has been our best bet What's next for us? Uh, John showed some things in the beginning with this. We're gonna be pursuing the same thing in a slightly different way. Um, we are gonna be adding active listeners. So we've got right now where we can read from S3 and where we can read from CloudWatch. We're gonna be adding probably Logstash in ECS using Fargate. And we've got a proof of concept stood up for this. It works great. It's an active listener, meaning you can just talk to this log stash, and it's able to write these logs back into S3 for us, and we can just go straight from there. We've also got an API gateway proof of concept. This is for people that want to like, call a put API with their log information in there. If you've got application developers, sometimes they'd like to have that sort of interface. So we have an API gateway. That API gateway is actually going to call our same Lambda again, 
It's just a different interface to the same thing. And so that's gonna work as more people on board, they have different ways they wanna ingest that, but we're able to leave the, le the rest of our pipeline the exact same. You wanna come back up, John? All right. Well, thank you again uh, for coming out, everybody. Uh, we've talked about ingest and ingest patterns with Amazon Elasticsearch service. Uh, Josh provided us some great uh, stories and usage, uh, how they do it at Pearson. Um, and I hope you enjoy the little bit of conference that's left. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, guys.